four French drivers at the French Grand Prix trying to win this on the final lap. The three wide again, Guillaume down the inside. Guillaume moves across, they're both in front of Milan and Puget. But before you know it, we find ourselves here in the very final race of the competition. And then they see truck racing and they think, this is crazy, you know, these are five ton machines, 1200 horsepower brake. Oh, look at that switchback. Oh, it's a bit of a switch is going off. Racing isn't easy, but experiencing it is. iRacing puts you in the driver's seat with the industry's leading sim racing game. Drive on laser scan replicas of the greatest racing circuits from around the world. Go head to head against other drivers chosen by skill based matchmaking to ensure competitive racing at every level. Compete across all your favorite series. In officially licensed cars, engineered to deliver the most accurate driving experience possible. Join a race or host your own with players from across the globe. Race against the computer or in a league with friends. Feel the thrill behind the wheel. Visit iRacing.com. Well, hello everybody, welcome to Chaz Draycott Media and welcome to round six of the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship here from the fantastic Road America. This is one of the circuits on the calendar that I have been looking forward to the most and it is, as you've probably seen in the YouTube description on the socials and all sorts, I've been calling it Slipstream Central because this place is going to really bring out those that are key uh, thinking about their strategies or good at thinking about their strategies I should say in this one hour encounter this is another one of our endurance rounds of the championship as opposed to the two 30 minute races like we had last time out at Sebring where we had an absolute whale of a time and by we I mean myself Chaz Draycott and Ed May who's back with me in the box Ed we had possibly one of the best last laps we've ever watched on the channel at Sebring uh, it's gonna be hard to top that isn't it <laughs> Yeah, what a, what a race we had in store for us. Basically, the first two races, the only two races, were brilliant, weren't they? That second race as well that saw Jan Stitchbury take his first win of the season was just big as belief, wasn't it? Some of the stuff he was pulling out to keep the likes of Luke Lucchese, Tristan Neubrega, and I think it was actually uh, Troy Dolinchek, who was his main rival, mm. chasing him down. That was just absolutely stunning drive, and you might be in for... A little bit more of the same, maybe something different, of course. This is just the single one-hour endurance race, so you won't have the chance for reverse grids to shake up the order, but we will have some excellent racing from start to finish, I'm sure. We absolutely will, and, of course, we have a certain amount of uh, championship contenders to look at and think about. We'll have a look at how the championship standings are. Thanks very much to James Bostock for sorting out the image standings for us, or the image of the standings. Troy Dolinchek leads the way in the elite class, but it's Yanis Albert that's moved up into second position now. He is ahead of Luke Lucchese and Tristan Dino Brega in the RDSA Esports Porsches. Jean McLuhan sits in fifth place at the moment, only one point ahead of Thomas Pugh. Let's not forget Thomas had a fantastic run at the end of the second race at Sebring. And it's certainly very close behind him as well. Always points to play for in these championship standings. We look now at the Premier class, which is the sort of middle ground of it. But Gianni Terha has taken quite the lead there with 61 points over his teammate Tristan Engelstad. It's looking good for Quad Dash at the moment. Matt Ho Hoyland, I should say, excuse me, sits in third. Simon Cheshire just one point ahead of Joe Glass. And then they're only two points ahead of Alex Fretwell as well. So even closer amongst those guys. On to the Evo class standings, which is the third class out there. 
It's a slim 29-point lead for Wesley Van Rens. He didn't have the most straightforward of times at Sebring, but John Ludbrook has been going well all the way through. So too is Gareth Newton and Rob Mackay as well. Quite even spacing between those guys. And finally, we have the team's championship standings to think about. And it's hardly surprising, is it, Ed, the two teams that are up there right at the top, Quad Dash Racing and RDSA. But Quad Dash doing a fantastic job with those 619 points. Yeah, I mean, Quad Dash, to be fair, they only have the two drivers to score points. And while there are only two drivers that can score points in any given round in the team's championship, they don't have an extra driver to give them that safety net in case one of them has a bad round. So the consistency of Tristan Ingolstadt and Ginny Taha, bearing in mind as well they are in the premier class, not the elite class, is just a testament to their ability and their consistency as well, which is, I think, the main difference maker certainly is certainly is hello to all of you that are going to be out there tonight watching us here on youtube and on facebook dxt tv live saying good to be missing the race but looking forward to watching team dxt we ride on board here with troy dolinchek the championship leader as he makes his way down towards what i think is turn two here ed but a lot of people say it's turn three because the little kink apparently is turn two what do you reckon is it going to be turn two or three tonight well whoever says it's uh turn three is wrong yes um, well, whatever is between turns one and three is not a turn. I'm no, sorry, that's not a turn. Not. You don't need to put barely any steering input in whatsoever. You don't even register it. I mean, again, this is I deem this is just a one long straight. I don't deem there as any turns, but yep. some people deem the little bend to the right and the left as a couple of turns, which yeah, okay. I don't seem to understand at all. Now, I've only just noticed this about the RDSA esports cars, but there's a few little sort of trickle or stripes just on the back of the bonnet there. It's giving me real sort of Lucky Strike BAR vibes from the early 2000s, as I've noticed along there, and I'm not quite sure why it's taken me that long to realise it, but still, we look at Troy in the Porsche 992 911 GT3R. Gorgeous looking race car. Clearly the car to be in this season. And let's not forget, though, Yayan Stitchbury, who's just behind him on the circuit. Yayan, by the look of it, in a different livery for this round, actually. He was in a, a fully black livery before, but he's now in a chrome-looking livery on my screen, anyway. Yeah, it looks uh, very nice. Break. Yeah, it looks very, very tidy, doesn't it? And he's straight off the back of an overall race victory. Did an amazing job in round five, didn't he? Yeah, looking very nice indeed, getting up to uh, his first ever race victory. Of course, he did have the benefit of the reverse grid helping him out, but that doesn't take away from the drive that he put on. Built up a little bit of a gap, and then as we saw, the likes of... Well, all of the ideas in eSports drivers caught up to him. Troy Dolinchek really carved up, carved his way up through the field following his race one victory. But he just couldn't get past this man that we're on board with now, Jan Stitchbury, who was just sublime. And then he backed the cars in behind him up together to cause a little bit of drama. And then also, let's talk about that final corner because it was completely turned on its head, wasn't it, the race in that one moment? Mm. Yeah, definitely. You know, that little bit of contact between the teammates, Luke Lucchese was involved. And he just, he, actually, no, I think he hit the back of the, didn't he hit the back of the Lamborghini with Yannis? Yeah, it was Yannis Albert's Lambo, wasn't he, that he hit the back of him? Um, or was it? No, I can't remember now. There was so much going I on. If it was... No, I think he hit the back of Dolinchek, didn't he? I can't. Again, trying was... to cast my mind back <laughs> through was, everything that happened. There was happened. so much went on in that one moment. so much that was going <laughs> on at that one moment in time. It's just... Beggar's belief, you'd have to just watch it all back again because the carnage was... Yeah, go was... watch it. Go watch it, everyone. Go watch it. <laughs> it was... Maybe not right away. Yeah, stay here for now. The... Watch after. Yeah, because... It was a, absolutely epic. Epic beyond belief. Um, we do have a new driver out there tonight by the look of it in the form of Jack Pierre Mohammed for Ludcrook Racing. He's just sat in the pits at the moment. In terms of other drivers on the track, don't see any others that we haven't seen before anyway. Uh, we've got Matt Barnett out there on the circuit in the Lamborghini. He's currently 19th position overall, 8th position in class, also for the Octane Racing Motorsports Omega team. Love the Lamborghini. We were talking about the sound that this thing makes back at Sebring. And it is a wonderful, wonderful looking race car. Let's not forget as well, if you look on the left-hand side of your screen, that is how the field is overall at the moment. The cars with the little yellow stripe Next to their name is basically the Premier class, the sort of middle ground class, and then the ones with the red stripe next to them are the Evo class. They're going to be a little bit further down the order on paper. We'll go to Wesley Van Rens. You'll see there's a few more of them around here. He is the current championship leader, though, 
in that class here, Ed. So he's got a bit of pressure on his shoulders here because he didn't win the class at Sebring. And he needs to make sure he keeps scoring those points, doesn't he, and opening up that advantage, especially when there's only one chance at it tonight here at Road America. Yeah, I think Wesley was serving a qualifying uh, ban mm. last time out, so wasn't able to Ooh. get the best result. As theory, me, that was a very scary rejoin by the Mercedes there. Not entirely sure that was Joe Sparza there. You know, we can see him now just trying to get back pointing the right way, but in the last few minutes of practice, there's nothing really to be gained by just driving down the straight before the session comes to a close. So he takes his trip into the pits and gets ready for the qualifying session. It's just about to get underway and Chaz what are your predictions for this qualifying session you can see in the practice there's a few runaway contenders for a certain class victories but do you reckon that will translate in towards the qualifying session it's difficult to get a lap together here actually similar to circuit of the americas that we were at a few weeks ago the off tracks here the uh, the track limits are very very harsh so i think there are going to be a few drivers here that fall foul of that during qualifying we've got james bostock funnily enough who is the first car to head out and he is going to go straight on to circuit for the P-Tech GP2 team. Just watching him now make his way around the first couple of corners. Love the look of this with the sort of chrome effect on it. James has done a lot to help us put these broadcasts together and make them what they can be and we certainly hope that you all enjoy them. A lot of the guys have been very kind in Discord and let us know that they uh, they have enjoyed what they've watched so far. We've enjoyed doing it. But yeah, I'm not sure here, Ed, because I think this is just going to be a case of getting a banker lap in. They get four laps. They've extended the session a little bit. It's usually 18 minutes, but it's 20 here just because of how long a lap is. Let's not forget they have to do about two and a half minutes almost to just get around and do a sort of warm-up lap, don't they? So I'm not sure. I think we're still going to see the RDSA guys and Yanis Albert up there, but there's a few of them that maybe they'll push a little bit too hard and just trigger track limits like we saw there, actually, with James Bostock. And, I mean, speaking of track limits as well, Chaz, you've just brought me on to my next point, which is about the incident limit for this race being 14x for the whole hour. Do you anticipate drivers maybe approaching very slightly differently with that in mind? I oh, know this isn't a track that's renowned for sort of off-track and one incident limit penalties, but... You can easily rack them up over that length of time. Yeah, definitely. I think they're going to have to be very careful with that this evening. There's going to be a lot of people that will fall foul of it in the race just trying to have battles because, again, it's another one of those circuits where when you're following a car very closely in front of you, you can't really see a lot of the apexes. I mean, look here, through the left-hander over the top, there's a really wide run on the right-hand side that you can't see until you're there. Sometimes if you're following a car and you get a little bit dirty air off them, it will push you very, very wide, so... We'll have to see how they survive that. And here's Jack Pierre Mohammed for the Ludcrook Racing Team. I believe his debut out there this evening. I don't remember seeing him at Interlagos, but I can't believe we're already at round six, to be fair. It's a 16-round uh, championship, and it's certainly been a very exciting one so far. Hope the broadcast is all looking good, everybody that's watching. Great to have you with us here tonight. A big shout out again to our championship sponsors at Medius, at Kame, Keenan, Eco Energy, and AB Designs as well. Great to have you on board. And thanks as always to the organizers of the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship. It is great, great fun to do what we do up here in the commentary box. So, waiting to see times on the board, but the drivers are pretty much only just getting on to their fast laps now, Ed, as we see Alex Fretwell coming around the final corner. Yeah, Alex Fretwell, of course, another drive that we saw at the start of the season, pull out some great races, wasn't it, into Lagos. That was really a round to remember for him. But since then, he hasn't quite hit the same strides that we saw. And wonder if this is going to be a turning point for him to maybe try and rekindle a little bit of that early season form. What do you reckon, Chaz? I reckon he can. I reckon he can. I think he's been, uh, he's been caught up in a few unfortunate incidents since the very first race meeting. He looked really strong, actually, in some of the battles for the Premier Class at Interlagos. Had a little bit of a wobble there on the exit of Turn 2. But again, that's easy to do. It's another one where the kerb sort of drops off the circuit and it's very difficult to see where it is until you're on top of it and sometimes already running mm. wide. Actually, as well, actually speaking about Alex Fretwell, he's, uh, been, he was on the podium for 
first race with the victory and then the second race of the season with the second place. And from there, his best finish has been sixth, which was at round three mm. at Circuit of the Americas at Sebring. Last time out, he finished 12th and 16th wow. in his class, which just goes to show he's really had a terrible round, a round to forget at Sebring. So looking to bounce back with a little bit of better fortune here at Road America. We'll certainly keep our eye out for him. There's a lot of drivers in the field as well to keep our eyes on. And we do apologise as well. There was uh, a driver or two last week that weren't too happy that we didn't give them an interview. But when we try and only grab three of a potential, at least nine drivers that have finished on the podiums in their classes, then uh, we can sometimes miss some of the stories of the, uh, the sort of evening that the drivers have had. And we've got Jamal Gandor, fastest at the moment. Normally he goes out quite late in the, uh, in the qualifying session to entertain us. Times are coming in now from the elite class and it's Yanis Albert for Sumo Racing that's gone fastest at the moment in the Lamborghini ahead of Tristan Dino Brega, Jamie Reese, and of course behind them Jack Pierre Mohamed. It's now Nathan Crook that is fastest for Lud Crook Racing. Nathan's been very exciting this season. He's followed by Joe Glass, Jacob Collier and Jamal Gandor. John Ludbrook actually, Nathan's teammate is quickest in the Evo class at this moment in time as well. But great stuff that by Yanis Albert in the Lamborghini, certainly stretching its legs around here at Road America. Yeah, Yanis was also the last driver to take a pole position in this championship. He managed to get up onto pole position at Sebring, and we'll be hoping for much the same. But Luke Lucchese has just dethroned him at the top of these standings by the thinnest of margins. 29 thousandths of a second the difference between first and second place is provisionally in this qualifying session we know that of course as the tires get more up to temperature the circuit gets more rubbered in times will of course fall towards the end of the session or the end of these drivers qualifying runs so expect that to maybe change around a little bit before the end Stephen Cakebread here Coming up as a private here, but this time in the Ferrari, as I remember, he was in the BMW was, previously. Yeah, BMW. So clearly uh, didn't like the look of it, much like I don't. And he thought, I know, I'll choose another ugly car. Let's go for the Ferrari 296. <laughs> but no, he's got I the... i got to uh, say. It looks a lot better in that livery, doesn't it? <laughs> it looks... It looks the dogs unmentionables. That is really, really nice. You can see the same sort of colour scheme that he had, the black, red and yellow stripes with the... Shell branding as well, actually. It reminds me a lot of the sort of Ferraris of old when they were sponsored by Shell, weren't mm. they? And sort of not Ferraris of old, old, but old for me. And that's <laughs> talking about like the 20, 2012 season. I think they still are. So I think they, are they? Oh, oh, yeah, they do. do yeah, they, do, they do, do still, still have it. It's not quite as prominent. Though, no, I, I think. think it's because it's something we've been so used to seeing all along. Yeah. They always had a Shell logo on the side pod, didn't they? Um, Graham Matthew is about to improve, and there he goes. Fastest in the Evo class. Great stuff by Graham. Still Lucchese and Crook in the Premier class that are fastest of theirs. I do like this livery on the KM racing machine. Looks like some sort of skin that you get on Rocket League or something, doesn't it? With all the very bright colours and high contrast. Tristan Engelstad has just gone second fastest in the Premier class. And it looks like out of those that are serving qualifying bands, I think Ashley Brooks is maybe one of them. Jean McLuhan I don't think has gone out. There's a few drivers that haven't completed laps yet, actually. Ian Stitchbury's just crossed the line, and he has gone seventh fastest in the elite class at this moment. There's still a few more. Troy Dolinchek hasn't put a clean lap in yet, actually. The championship leader pushing on around the carousel. But you can hear, look, he's on the brakes, dropping the revs, trying to keep the car tucked in. It's not an easy place to get the most out of a GT3 car, is it, Road America? Because corners like that, you have to be constantly making adjustments on the brakes and on the throttle. Yeah, it is one of those very technical and difficult circuits. It's got a lot of different corners as well, which is why I really like it, because it tests the drivers in all aspects. You've got those sort of more almost sort of like the hairpin style turns, that sort of those 90 degree left handers, especially towards what I would deem as turn three at the end of the long sort of back straight. You've got that sort of difficult section as well. There's a little dip on the inside that can catch a lot of the drivers out, especially in a few of these corners. I think the left-hander onto the carousel as well has another little dip on the inside that can throw drivers off. And then this final sector where you've got that sort of off-camber rise up the hill through the left-hander after the counter corner. And then to try and balance the car, drift over to the left-hand side of the circuit, try and spot your braking point for the all-important final corner, focus on the exit. It does shift your sort of perception of 
how you approach each corner in this car. It's wonderful. And then these first two corners, just lob it in. Really <laughs> chuck it on onto the inside. Just chuck it and hope it sticks. Current Premier Championship leader Gianni Tahar is about to put his first time on the board. See whether he can get anywhere near the front. He's got Nathan Crock and Engelstad up there. No, he's eight tenths of a second off at this moment. Luke Lucchese just ahead of Yanis Albert still. It's good to see Thomas Pugh back up there as well after his strong performance at Sebring. Not quite sure what it is about the Lamborghini, but compared to the Porsche, it looks a lot heavier in the way it moves around. It looks a lot more heavy and bobbly, doesn't it? When it's sort of bouncing off all the kerbs and all the uh, the bumps on the circuit. It just doesn't look as comfortable anywhere, but it looks like it's got good power behind it, you know? It's a very, uh, very odd car to watch sometimes. This is the... GT3 Evo version of the Lamborghini Huracan. I was lucky to see a couple of these just on Monday, actually. Just gone on Bank Holiday Monday at Alton Park. And again, I barely saw them because it was raining that much and they were sat behind a safety car for 40 minutes. But still, great to see the Lamborghinis in action. Barwell Motorsports Lamborghinis took the race victories, I believe. Spoilers, everyone. I'm sorry. But <laughs> great to have the mix of cars once again. Only a couple of Audis out there. Jacob Collier actually made his debut, didn't he, at Sebring last time out in the Audi. And he did a really good job. He was certainly keeping us excited. I think he's the only Audi out there tonight. It doesn't look like either of the other guys are out there, which is a shame. The, uh, yeah, the where, where, DXT yeah. Motorsports Academy drivers aren't turning up today, which is a bit of a shame. Mm. I think that was partly why we saw, was it the message in the chat yes. about DXT missing out some drivers? So it's a shame, but hopefully we will see them out on circuit next week for some more action. Yeah, fingers crossed. Be good to have the guys back. Mike Murphy in the chat saying evening all broadcast is looking great. Thank you very much, Mike. Great to see you, mate. Mike, a regular in the Sim Racing Magazine GT4 Challenge, which Ed and I run and broadcast. Uh, we have uprated the bitrate a little bit more as well for this week, so hopefully the tasty fibre connection is looking very good. Luke Lucchese's just improved his fastest lap there, Ed, but just before he did that, Troy Dolinchek went quicker as well, and Tristan Dinobrega also put in a good time, and the four of them were separated by less than a tenth of a second on a two-minute lap. That's ridiculous. Oh, it's so well, doesn't it, for the race to come. As Yanis Albert has taken a trip into the pit lane, so I believe that is his qualifying session over. Won't be seeing him out on the circuit. He's done his four laps, or done his three laps, but he's just ticked over into his fourth lap, so won't be able to improve and set a time. So I'll have to see if he's able to hold on to that third place, the sort of top of the second row as it stands. It's looking very impressive by Luke Lucchese, who's looking to take his first pole position of the season. Gianni Troy is... Sorry. Troy Dolinchek, I think, has taken every other pole position bar last week. I was just going to say there that uh, Gianni Tahar has completed his session, so it's looking good for Nathan Crook. I don't think anyone's going to beat his time from that class by the look of it. Uh, Gary Mitchell is going to be the next one to cross the line. He's currently in 38th place outright, 19th in his class. Across the line he goes. That looks like a new livery for him. He's actually brought back the Tunnox Caramel Bar livery. I think it's the, the old Caramel Bar livery. I was told about this before the series started. Or is it the tea cake? Oh, yes. That it, looks more like a tea is cake. Is it a tea cake? Yes, it is, Ed. You're absolutely right. Flipping out. I can, my teeth are hurting thinking about I'm that. I'm not a big boy, but I know my sweeties. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love a tea cake, but good God, I've got a hole in one of my teeth and it really doesn't like me right now, so I don't think I could even dare pick one up <laughs> still. Also, how are you going to eat them without getting chocolate all over you? Anyway, Troy Dolinchek crossing the line. Can he improve go. and go faster? You will, yeah, I mean... I <laughs> Mm. Anyway, Jamal Kandor crossing the line as well. Good evening, all you guys in the chat as well. Tris Eng saying hello. He's saying I'm sweating already. Uh, White Van Gaming mm. saying, any thoughts on the facelift advantage running both classes of British GT? <laughs> when they announced it, I thought, oh my goodness me, that's the prettiest GT3 car I've ever seen. When you see it in person, it looks like one of them plastic RC cars that the body is too big for the wheelbase. It looks awful. I have to say it. It looks like the body is made of really like light, flimsy plastic and the wheels are too small for it. It didn't look good at all. And the GT4 is just disgusting. It looks like an anglerfish. Disgusting is probably a bit harsh because it's not ugly, but the front end is not pretty. Um, I don't think that the, um, the deliveries that they were running really 
sort of complement the car too well. I think you can no. do a bit more with them. Absolutely, yeah. And the I've, I can't believe I'm calling it the older version of the uh, the Vantage, but the GT3 that was also running with uh, two other teams, they were just absolutely gorgeous. You know, the green and the, uh, mm. the silver sort of stripes and the curves. The only thing was, though, because of said livery not really flowing with the car, it never made them look like they were going very fast. I mean, they were. Mm. <laughs> they were absolutely I, I'm languishing at points, but okay. yeah. I've still got a really soft spot in my heart for Aston Martins. I really love the GT4 that we have on iRace, and I'm hoping against hope that we get a GT3 Aston. We have the GT1, which is just a bonkers bit of kit that I love to bits, and I'm praying that we get a GT3 at some point in the near future, because I'm just, i just a bit of a fanboy for Aston, really. Absolutely. I love them to bits. And, uh, Hopefully they translate the sound over as well, because they do sound... Oh, they sound brutal. So it's, it's possibly one of the most brutal sounds, because the GT3, especially the older one, every single upshift is a massive cannon fire. It's amazing. It's like the old Bentley used to be, you know. It's just awesome. Oh, the really Boatley. Awesome. Yeah, the Boatley. I do love a Boatley. Uh, White Van Gaming says, Vindication. I hate it myself after what used to be such a pretty car. You know what? It reminds me of when it's they've done the opposite thing to what Jaguar did to the F-Type. Because the Jaguar F-Type had these beautiful eye-shaped lights on the front of it. They were absolutely stunning. Then they made it look all mean and pointy, and they ruined it. Aston Martin have gone the other way. They've gone from these sort of really slim, evil-looking eyes to make it all sort of gawpy and, you know, a big, horrible face on it. I, I don't know. They've gone the opposite way, but come out with the same effect as the F-Type. And in similar-shaped lights as well, actually. Um, Trist, Trist Engelstad. Ah, yes, of course. Tristan Engelstad is uh, the other guy in the chat. PC Racing saying, good luck, Sumo Racing, Yanis and Gareth. I love Road America. Gutted to be missing. Oh, it's Paul Cowlishaw. We're gutted to be missing you as well, Paul. You've been an absolute star in uh, recent weeks, and we hope you have a wonderful evening wherever you may be and look forward to getting you back out on circuit again very soon. Uh, qualifying is pretty much finished here, Ed. The guys are just doing laps for a bit of vanity now. Actually, Jean McLuhan, I think, is... Um, no, he has completed his, all of his laps, actually. But Luke Casey's going to take pole position in the elite class. Then it's Nathan Crook. And then Graham Matthew doing a wonderful job in the Evo class. So we have our pole sitters. Well, the guy's just getting in that extra bit of practice. Yeah, and also impressive to see that Luke Casey has gotten his first pole position of the season. Is another RDSA esports driver on pole, but it is not Troy Dolinchek who's been able to keep that stranglehold for so long, which was recently broken isn't it, by the driver who's currently lining up third on the grid, Yanis Albert. But once again, Yanis stuck in the midst of the RDSE Esports squadron. And what do you reckon he's going to be doing from there? Because he's going to be boxing, you imagine, into turn one. Yeah, you've got to be smart off the start here because it's two right-handers. And if you're the driver on the outside, you need to really be committed to holding your line there and not overdoing it. Uh, we've got a few cars sat in the pit lane. You can see here a view down the start finish straight of all the pit boxes. And we'll give you the overall look at the order on the left hand side. You can see Nathan Crook and Tristan Engelstad breaking their way in amongst some of the elite drivers. That'll just scroll up there like that. You've got then Graham Matthew in 19th position. Leading the way in the Evo class, then Russell Jakes as well. Second place for him for MRC 493. Stephen Catebred, third in class. Then it's John Ludbrook and Alex Kernratz in 31st outright for PTEC GP2. Uh, Ashley Brooks is on the circuit, actually. Now Ashley's giving us uh, a, bit of a, a bit of a look at the car, at least, for Glass Tech Racing. But I think he's serving a qualifying ban. Oh, he must have heard us. He's, <laughs> he's run off. But I think he's uh, <laughs> suffering a, uh, a qualifying ban. Luke Lucchese has decided to go out there and do some vanity laps now as well, giving us something to look at. <laughs> Great to see. The RDSA Esports. Lap. Sorry, go on. As I was going to say, his last lap was very impressive as well, wasn't he? Just to extend his advantage. Mm. I'm not sure if it's actually... Um showing up that he's done any more improvements but he's still going for it which is great to see yeah indeed Tristan yeah, Dinabrega en show. ended up 29 thousandths of a second behind him as well so mighty yeah. close there yeah really nice Albo he isn't million miles off either nor is Troy Dolinchek those four were basically separated by one and a half tenths of a second which over like you say a two minute lap it's nothing. Yeah, it's absolutely minimal. Like you usually expect the gaps to be exaggerated on a track like that, 
But yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely nuts, really, that these guys are so similar on a lap time. You think about what differences cause 29 thousandths of a second. It's just, it's minute differences, really. So yeah, the fact that they are so close together shows the talent level that they're at and also how close to the, uh, the limit they're at as well. And Martin Kenyon asking us how many Porsches are on the grid. Goodness me. Uh, I mean, I've counted down to 30th place and I think I've got about 17. <laughs> I'd say there's a good... I mean, how many cars have we got tonight? 44 cars. I think we've probably got about 24 Porsches. It looks like there's a lot more Porsches on the surface, but there's a bunch of Ferraris, Mercedes and Lamborghinis and a couple of BMWs in amongst it as well. We've even got the Audi of Jacob Collier as well. A bit further down he is. He's qualified actually in 16th hmm. place. I think I've counted 23 as well. So that's basically half the field. <laughs> Stephen Cake Red saying there's 1 million and 27 <laughs> Porsches on about, the grid. I think over half the field is in a Porsche. <laughs> yes, indeed. Jan is in the chat as well just saying Porsche. Absolutely. Yep. But yeah, it's going to be a busy old race this, but the qualifying session has just come to an end. I really enjoy Road America, Ed. I think it's a great, great circuit. I'd never actually driven it until I think it arrived as a DLC on Forza 3. I know nobody asked, but I remember never knowing what the layout was like, giving it that first go and thinking, wow, what a great circuit this is. Not the best in the world to hot lap because of the straights, but for the racing and the sort of mind games you have to play, it's just epic, isn't it? It's really good. I really like it. It's such a difficult circuit, though, if you do manage to put it on pole position because you cannot break away from anyone in behind. There's just so many long, flat-out sections where drivers who get in behind you within a second can just hook up to your rear bumper and stick with you for the whole race which does mean you need to get a little bit creative with the strategy and i wonder if we're going to see any of these rdsa esports drivers with the amount of drivers they have maybe try something different to throw off Yanis alba who's currently in the midst of their well charles to try to lock out the podium yet again they absolutely are Yanis alba right up there with the guys so this is your grid then for round six of the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship. Luke Lucchese starts on pole position just 29 thousandths of a second ahead of his teammate Tristan Dinobrega. Yanis Albert is alongside Troy Dolinshek on row two. Those guys will be playing the long game here, I'm sure, with Ryan Ottens up there for Alpha One Esports and John McLuhan alongside him. Thomas Pube starts in seventh place for Barbecue Bread Racing, and Nathan Crook is the lead Evolution, uh, sorry, not the Evolution class, the Premier class car. We'll get there eventually, James. I'm sorry. Tristan Engelstad is ninth, with the Iron Stitch Bree in tenth. Christoph Demay in eleventh. He's had a bit of a rough season so far. Jamie Reese next up in twelfth place, and then following them in thirteenth and fourteenth, we have Gianni Taha. Marcel Breitenbach is fourteenth for Barbecue Bread Racing. Then we have Matt Hoyland alongside Jacob Collier. Joe Glass and Jamal Gandor are next up with then Graham Matthew leading the way in the Evo class. Then it's Jack Pierre Mohammed in 20th. Then it's Robin Aston and Russell Jakes on row 11. James Rankin is next up in car 167. He's alongside Matt Barnett. Stephen Donnelly is 25th ahead of Javier Talavera with Alex Fretwell and Hussein Saraka Desla next up. Stephen Cake Red is 29th ahead of John Ludbrook who completes the top 30. Alex Kernratz is 31st with Joe Shapara in 32nd. Matthew Jones and James Bostock make up row 17 of the grid. Rob Mackay is in 35th with Wesley Van Rens in 36th position. We then have Paul Robson 37th, Gary Mitchell 38th, Gareth Newton 39th with James Pallett completing the 40, Chris Keenan and Owen Seward on the 21st row of the grid, Dave Russell and Ashley Brooks bringing up the rear of the field. So once again, a colossal grid here, Ed. Great numbers since the very start of this championship. And I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what the guys can make of that. We are a few down this evening, but still, every night that you turn up is an opportunity to score points. Yes, absolutely. You cannot win the lotto if you don't buy a ticket, so why not get involved in the mix? And we're seeing KZ's rear wing and the chasing pack in behind. You can see the Technicolor Lamborghini and behind him of Yanis Albert starting in third place. But what a second row we have. Yanis Albert and Troy Dolinshek, the first and second in the Elite Class Championship. What a championship we have in store for us, Chaz, especially towards the 
next phase of the season because Yanis has admitted that he doesn't sort of fit too well with these more American style tracks but we do have a trip to the more European circuits mm. later on in the season so we might see the momentum shift in his direction he's certainly been able to show some great pace though at Sebring yeah absolutely uh, we have the first half of the season over in the Americas we're in South America at Interlagos then literally circuit of the Americas Sebring then here at Road America next time out for the sprint races we go to Circuit de Villeneuve and I'm so excited about that I love it at Montreal I think it's an amazing amazing racetrack very tough very very tough everyone forgets how difficult it is there but then we come over to Europe for the second half of the season we go to Hockenheim Barcelona Catalonia Hungaro Ring Imola and Mugello what a fantastic list of circuits that is as well Mugello is a circuit I've never actually broadcasted before here on iRacing, so I'm looking forward to seeing what we can do with that very scenic circuit over in Italy, and one where I think these GT3 cars will really come to life. But here at Road America, it's probably a track that a lot of drivers have got a lot of experience of, actually, isn't it, Ed? You do see this one used quite a bit in, uh, in a lot of official races. Yeah, it is a popular circuit for good reason, because it does bring up some very entertaining races, both in the official and league racing format. I know we've visited here a few times, haven't we, Chaz, for various different league events, and it always brings up some excellent racing. Same with Daytona. I know that's a favourite of yours and mine as well, those circuits with the long straights. While they maybe aren't so loved by the drivers, they are loved by us in the broadcast booth because they give us some excellent racing and constant action, which always keeps us on our toes. So for the next hour... We're going to have some wonderful racing to bring you as we wait for Luke Lucchese to get this race underway. Just coming around the final corner now, it's an interesting place to try and get a rolling start underway when you're at the front because you have a big uphill battle, not quite as literally as, uh, as the hill in front of you, but still, you have to think about your timing. The Porsche safety car pulls in, that's the 911-991. Luke Lucchese will, I'm sure get on the throttle as soon as he is halfway up the hill maybe just over the crest we'll have to wait and see and the field backs up slightly Luke Lucchese making them hold and now he goes and round six of the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship gets underway and straight off the bat Tristan Dino Brega moves over to the right hand side oh dearie me I think the Lamborghini there of Thomas Pugh got squeezed over to the right hand side by Jean McLuhan had to try and stay out of the wall they remain two by two behind us. Oh, a bit of contact in the middle there. I think Jamal Gandor nearly got hit by, I think that was Jack Pierre Mohammed just behind him. They've got to be really careful not to pinch together and have an incident down here. We've seen some big, big hits down there between the two of us, Ed. But a very relatively tidy start there. A little bit of argy-bargy in the middle of the field. But if we go on board with Gareth Newton here, you get an idea of the colossal stream of cars ahead of us. It says that we're ninth. We're actually 41st outright. That's 10th uh, in class at the moment but wow very very good job by everyone tidy start yeah gareth newton there with owen seward just up ahead of him in towards the heavy braking zone and you can see the car park that's formed up ahead of him having to go at a snail's pace as there's a couple of cars stuck together it's and van that Renz. looks to be the two ferraris of wesley van Rens. and is that uh was james. that gary mitchell or james pallet that was stuck onto him it's james pallet uh, it wasn't James Pallet, it Gary was Mitchell. Gary it was Mitchell, Mitchell you were right, yeah. in that Tonics tea cake livery. Almost getting a bite taken out of him there by nah. Wesley Van Rens. <laughs> Christ. Uh, Yanis Albert is going to be happy about the fact that he's got Troy Dolinchek and Ryan Ottens a little bit behind because he's got a gap, although Jacob Collier in the Audi has decided that he wants to go grass tracking at the carousel. Not quite sure what's happened there. Everyone behind is going to have to avoid slightly. Oh, he's definitely got a problem here. What on earth has gone on for Jacob Collier? I think he's just trying to rejoin the circuit, but he's stuck at a very awkward position because there's going to be so many cars streaking on by. Now he's able to get up to pace. He was being very cautious in trying to get back onto the circuit, but just from the nature of how the circuit went and then being a couple of wheels onto the grass, a couple of wheels onto the tarmac, it was so difficult to get the car to do exactly what he wants to do. So just he's a Something, bit of a checkup, does evasive action. He was I think something's slightly gone upset, wrong. cold tyres. Do you think? Something's gone wrong behind the scenes there the way that he just sped up into the corner and then suddenly like he's staying off the road like normally now you'd have thought he'd carry on going but it's like the wheel's not behaving or something he's doing something out like behind the scenes there definitely because he would have got straight back on the circuit and just sped mm. up because he still had the ability to do so that is a big big shame but still 
Luke Lucchese has had a very tidy first lap. He's got Tristan Dinobrega behind him, Yanis Albert in third. Ryan Otten's doing well, holding on into fifth place. But then John McLuhan has got everybody piling in behind him. Look at that shot there. Jan Stitchbury, Thomas P. Tristan Engelstad in the Mercedes there as well, leading the class ahead of Nathan Crook, actually. The two of them battling together. Oh, Nathan's just come across the front. Nathan just decides that he wants to squeeze Tristan to the apex, and he's taking himself off. That was all of a sudden making something out of nothing there. Nathan Crook really was just trying to cut across to get that inside line, but... The overlap was well and truly there. Doesn't make the same mistake, though, and affords the inside this time to Matt Barnett. Yeah, that was a very strange one because it wasn't something that was necessary. It's all my word. Oh, Luck Brook Racing now. having a terrible time. Jack Pierre Mohammed now off the circuit. This is what happened then. So he gets to the right-hand side of Engelstad. He breaks a little bit later than him, but then he just comes across to the left. Oh, I don't know, actually. From there, it doesn't look yeah. like he comes left, but... He was in the middle of the road when the contact happened. It's really, really strange, isn't it? We'll have a look from this angle, see if we can maybe slow it down and have a look, see how it happened. Oh, it's, mm. it's strange because he's still on the road, but everybody else is over the kerb on the right. And I think see, Engelstad Engels expected yeah. him to be there, didn't he, I think? Engelstad looks to be trying to open out the corner, but maybe opens it up a little bit too much. So he might have judged Nathan a little bit too harshly there. It looks... Maybe it'd be six of one, half a dozen of the other. Yeah. They both have their little part to play in that incident, I think. Here's Jack Pierre Mohammed. This is what happened to him as he goes through the right kink. Is he going to bounce off the car in front? He puts his nose down the inside. Oh, he gets a bit of a wiggle, then gets clipped by Jamal Gandor and oh, goes into the wall hard. Again, a little bit of... He was a bit eager, wasn't he, to get in on that one. And then he's reversed it into the wall to try and stay out of the way. He's, whoa, scares a few. Goodness me, a few of the other guys there jumping out of the way and trying to steer clear, but Jack Pierre Mohammed back out there on the circuit, and the race continues on. 55 minutes remain. It's blown this battle wide open. And in terms of the lead in the Evo class, by the way, it's Graham Matthew, but he's right amongst all these other cars from the Premier class, so he's needing to be careful here and not get caught up in their fights. He's got a few cars between himself and Russell Jakes. This is a scary place to be in, though, if you're a class leader, isn't it? Yeah, Russell Jacques, I believe, in seven, in the number seven Porsche. You can just about see it in and amongst all of the cars on the circuit now. Is Gray Matthew really opening up the corner, going nearly off the circuit to <laughs> give forward some space to the inside? Doesn't seem to be working out for a moment because I think Robin Astor is looking to get up his inside. I think Robin now has actually just dropped back a little bit there. And this is Russell Jacques, we can see on board, and he is... Having a look now, only two seconds behind the Evo class leader, but he's got, well, six cars between him. I'm interested. Just shows how close it is. Josh Parr has done a wonderful job on the back of that Mercedes. That's very low downforce spec, but he's still got the diffuser on the car. It's the light blue Lamborghini that he's chasing for class position a bit further up the road. So at the moment, it's actually looking quite safe for Graham Matthew, but he just needs to hold on and keep it safe. Josh Parr all over the back of James Bostock right now in the Porsche. Mercedes wiggling this way and that way, very light on the rear end, as I've said. Look at that shot through there, they go absolutely flying down towards Canada Corner. Gives him all the room in the world, onto the grass and everything. Nearly clips the back of him as there's a bit of contact in there. Matt Hoyland is off in the wall. Hoyland around into the barriers hard, into the penultimate corner. And that car is going to need more than just a quick repair. Let's have a look at how he's done it. Has he just dipped a wheel on the grass, do you reckon, Ed? It's easy to do. Let's have a look, maybe on the exit, actually on the inside, and the yeah. car bottoms out when it recompresses back Oof. down. Big heavy hit into the wall. The grass does a good job of slowing him down, but that is big, big impact, and he's only now just gotten up and running and needs to take a trip into the pit lane to get that thing fixed up and ready for the remainder of the race. Battle going on for third place outright here. Yanis Albert under pressure now from Troy Dolinchek. Troy's managed to shake off Ryan Ottens and look at that. Dolinchek already in front. He had the run out of turn two and he's managed to make it work now. It's an RDSA Esports 1 2 3 once again. And Yanis Albert finds himself in a position where he has to just play the smart game and just try and outdo them in the long run here. He's lost that position for now. Can he do something with the strategy later into the race? The Lamborghini singing away. But that Porsche is driving away. Looks very strong through this section of the circuit indeed. But Troy Dolinchek, yeah, as we know, rapid everywhere he goes. Yeah, Troy is very quick. And now that he has some clearer air, he's going to look to catch up to the back of his teammates. We know there's no 
team orders at RDSA Esports. We certainly know that after all the action that we saw at Sebring last time out in those closing stages, seeing Troy battle, I believe it was with Luke Lucchese in those dying phases. They came to blows through the second to last corner and then also in the last corner on that final lap. So maybe we'll see a little bit more of the same as he's got a couple of teammates to try and get the better of if he's hunting yet another race victory. Yanis Alba maybe conceding the position for now, trying to see if Troy can bring him close to that fight for the lead and then at the end of the race he'll make his pace for victory. Still 51 minutes to go in this race, so plenty of time for drivers to affect things, not just in oh. the circuit, but also in the pit lane, as that was a big moment there for the Lamborghini, Graham Matthew there, with a bit of contact. Again, class leader, mm. needing to be careful, and here he's got cars all around him, and they're all in the Premier class as well. Russell Jakes is just behind this, but... Goodness me, this is so, so busy. You've got his teammate Scott Kostrick watching from the chat as well. Good to see you, Scott. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. There was a moment for Nathan Crook again. He's actually side by side right now with James Rankin for CHR Motorsport. Let's see how this plays out into turn one. Crook down the inside. Nicely done. But yeah, Nathan went off the circuit, I think. Made a move on uh, Matt Barnett, it says. And then this is down into Canada Corner. This is where it all started. So. Nathan's going to drop back into this pack behind here. He's on the outside line. Into Canada corner he goes. He's just gone. Oh, there is contact as they turn in, actually. A little bit of a clip from the Lambo. And he waits for him as well, which is really fair. But then that's where the checkup happens. And everybody gets involved in that. There's actually more movement still going on now, you know. Oh, no. Donnelly's off. Well done, oh, hold the brake, Stephen. Oh, oh, oh no. Should have held it for a little bit longer, getting up and rolling. Caused a little <laughs> bit of a scare for James Pallet, but fair play. He kept it going. I don't know if he lifted off much, probably get this foot flat to the floor and hope to get out of the situation sooner rather than later as we've got Alex Kuhnrauts now chasing down Gary Mitchell. Alex in the Evo class, Gary in the Premier class. So change of positions won't affect the points at all for their championship but of course there is no rule that says you must get oh, out of the no. way is oh dearie me a big incident there in the carousel i think they've all avoided contact throughout all of it maybe a couple of tags here and there but that is a very difficult place for cars to get around you hopefully there's no one coming back i think chris keenan is a little bit of ways away so looks to be fine but james pallet after all we said about him oh well, there was... Tack around. Yeah, Jones tried to find a gap, and I think Pallet had to slow down slightly for the little incident that was going on in front of him. And then Jones tried to continue to follow him closely, but just lifted the back end of that Ferrari up. Uh, Hussein Saracadesla is having a bit of a wobble here, actually, as he comes onto the start finish straight, and Joe Shapara is going to blitz on past him in the Mercedes. James Bostock, actually, Saracadesla's teammate, is just behind him there. Still ahead of Graham Matthew, who threw all of that air, does actually held on to the Evo class lead. He's having a great job of it. Yeah, and where's his uh, rival for the Evo class lead, Russell Jack? He's now just coming into turn one. Next to get now, the Scottish driver trying to chase down that more important Evo class leader. Only a couple cars now between him and that first place. So a little bit less of a mountain to climb. Certainly is been a busy old start to this race here in the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship from Road America. Round six here on Chaz Dre Got Media. Thanks again to the championship sponsors, Kame to Medius, AB Designs and Keenan Eco Energy. We currently have Luke Lacasey leading the way from Tristan Dino Brega for RDSA Esports. Troy Dolinchek in third now ahead of Yanis Albert. Jean McLuhan still holding on ahead of Ian Stitchbury and Thomas Pugh. This little trio of Porsche, Mercedes and Lamborghini sounding and looking excellent through the kink we've got Marcel Brayton back leading the way for barbecue bread racing he's had a good start up four places at the moment uh, we've unfortunately had a drama for Joe Glass here he's off in the sand quite ironically gets back out on the circuit not quite sure if he had a spin all on his own there or whether he got some help but he recovers now just behind Robin Aston uh, Gianni Teha the championship leader in the premier class is currently second in class right behind Christoph Demai and Tristan Engelstad his teammate is four seconds behind him so 
Going pretty well at the moment for Gianni Terha, considering that he didn't start on pole position in that class, Ed. He's actually made quite a recovery, hasn't he? Yeah, he's done a very good job to get up to where he is now. Marcel Breitman back, though. You can see just a car ahead of that BMW, Christophe Demai. He's doing a very good job to hold on to the Premier Class lead. Looking up and down at some of the bigger movers in the field. Dave Russell is the driver who's gained the most positions over the course of the race in that BMW up 18 places since the start of the race, going to now become 19 as Joe Glass takes a trip into the pit lane. So Dave Russell promoted an extra position, currently sitting 13th in his class, however, so needs a little bit of work to do to score some more championship points. Yes, indeed. Makes his way down the pit lane now. It feels like it takes forever to get down the pit lane at Road America because you're not just going in a long, straight, boring line, but it's also a big hill as well. So it certainly does take its time. Looking here, though, at the race leader, Luke Lucchese, he's actually got Tristan Dinabrega starting to put him under a bit of pressure here. Not quite sure what the situation's going to be, though, with the two of them being teammates, whether they are going to battle each other. I'd like to think that they probably won't in this early stage. Maybe they'll wait until the pit stops a little bit later on. Try and just play the strategy game and then whoever's in front by mm. the end, they'll just have a little bit of a scrap in the final moments. We'll have a look and see if that will be the case or not. You can never be too certain in sim racing what the teammates are going to do. Sometimes you see them play very nicely and other times it's full on action from the start till the end. Here we have Rocknicky for DX Team Motorsports. Trying to get the order the Basically, sole runner of DXT Motorsports as Matt Hoyland, I think, is... Actually, no, he's gotten back out on circuit after his mm. incident, so... Let's see that his teammate hasn't called it quits. Neither will Rob, as he's chasing down Wesley Van Rens. And that Scuderia Panthera car. Again, the rear end of that Ferrari. Not the prettiest thing in the world, and we're hoping <laughs> to see the front of it in his rearview mirror pretty soon. Look at the king. Turn one. It's <laughs> so tricky, isn't it? You can hear him just having to lift off to keep the car on the circuit in the dirty air. These cars are affected by it, not as much as, say, open wheel cars, but they do still get a noticeable decrease in corner performance by being so close together. Really trying to chase down Wesley now. It looks like Wesley's actually the one that's starting to put a little bit of pressure on John Ludbrook and then Owen Seward just in front. Wesley, let's not forget, leads the championship in the Evo class. He had a bit of a drama early on. Jamal Gandor is the next car to take to the pit lane. I think he's the only guy on this lap as well, actually. Uh, it's saying to me that we, we have a, a counter on our timing software for off-tracks. Uh, it's not always exactly reflecting the, uh, the sim, but apparently Nathan Crook is the one with 10 at the moment. So he's not serving a drive through so it's clearly not quite that many in the, uh, in the actual sim at the moment. But as Ed rightly pointed out earlier, Dave Russell is the highest mover in the field. 21 positions gained at this moment. Fantastic run from him at this moment in time. In the BMW. He's still down there in 12th place in class, though, but the Premier class very hotly contested in all angles. Oh, Joe Glass has just been off again here, Ed. He's had another drama at the second to last corner. Here he mate. It really does seem to be struggling at this moment in time as Joe Glass and he thought about coming into the pits there mm. for a brief moment. Pit lane was calling to him, but he's carried on for now. As well, actually, uh, uh, Graham Matthew and Russell Jacques, that fight for the Evo class lead. Mm. There is now no cars between the two of them. Graham Matthew, if you look back behind him, he, right behind him is Russell Jacques looking to close that gap and get up into the Evo class lead. It's been Slow but steady progress for Russell. He's got a lot of time still to go in the race to execute his strategy, but you can now see that target just up ahead. Yes, indeed, and it's a bright blue target as well, that Lamborghini, especially from this angle. You've got to think that Dave Russell getting past Graham Matthew as well has probably held him up a little bit if they've had a fight. I think uh, Graham, well, he would have known what's going on as well. You know, he would have thought about his own bigger picture here and maybe not fought a car in another class, but looks to me like Russell Jake's actually doing a pretty solid job here at catching up. We'll have to see what the lap times are like when they cross the line. We'll stay on board with the Porsche, chasing down the Lamborghini. Two cars that make very different noises, have very different behaviours. Up across the line they go then, just halfway down the start finish straight. Keep our eye out for Graham Matthews' lap time. He did his personal best last time, actually. 207.02. So 206.1 for Graham Matthew, 206.3 for Russell Jake. So he's actually getting away at the moment, is Graham, which is... Music to his ears, I'm sure. 
at the top end of that class. Uh, Gianni Tejar is actually getting closer to Marcel Breitenbach, though, for the lead in the Premier class. Marcel runs a little bit deep there in the Ferrari, and the Porsche now has a chance to look down the inside. Is Gianni going to go for it? Yes, he is. Later on the brakes, championship leader takes the class lead here at Road America. Lovely, clean move. Great respect as well from Marcel Breitenbach. The two of them have got Christophe Demai for company as well, and he's in the elite class, so he's going to do everything he can do to dispatch of these cars as quickly as possible. But they won't want to give up the places, Ed, because no. they're battling for their own lead. Yeah, and they might be actually catch up to a battle just up ahead. So I think Jan Stitchbury's in a real ding dong mm. with Thomas Pugh and Jean McLuhan. I've been looking at that. And down. I saw the gap come down to a few thousandths of a second at one stage. They have been going side by side and two by two. Throughout McLuhan's lost two places. Circuit. We've had a look at and see. Uh, McLuhan, did he say he's lost out on a couple of places? Yeah, he was a few corners before we just looked at him. He was actually in front of both these guys. Jan Stitchbury sending it down the inside. Very aggressive move from Jan Stitchbury. Parks it on the apex as well. Gets a pretty good run. Moves over to the left a little bit. Sean McLuhan wants a piece of that. Tries to go back down the inside. Jan gives him just enough room. But then look behind them. Thomas Pugh's going to try and get the run on him here and take advantage of this in the Lamborghini. There's a bit of a check up through the kink. And I feel that Pugh is going to make the most of this and try and get around McLuhan. Oh, if he gets this done around the outside, that'll be lovely. Keeps the outside line. Great respect between the two. And now he's going to have the inside line for the carousel. That's great stuff, that by Thomas Pugh. Nicely done. Really setting up the move. A few corners in advantage in advance, knowing that he would lose out around the outside. But as long as he kept his nose just up the inside into the carousel, corner and the position would be his and Jean McLuhan didn't really have anything else he could do other than just concede the position hope that he didn't lose out another time this time to Jamie Rees who is chasing him down in behind car currently sitting in ninth place just behind that train of cars seemingly fine for the moment Jai Taha now into the lead of the premier class but looking now at Christophe Demai who gave a little sniff at the rear end of Marcel Brayton back, the lovely bread racing Ferrari. Putting the pressure of touch, obviously, doesn't matter too much if he loses out to Christophe Demai. Won't lose any points because they are in different classes. Of course, he could lose track of Chanta Hart, who's currently leading Premier Class. Let's not count out Tristan Engelstad as well. The last few laps have been very good for Tristan, gaining on the cars up ahead. So we could see a three way fight for this Premier Class. Absolutely could. It's very, very close at the moment between these guys. Uh, Graham Matthews' lead, by the way, in the Evo class has actually extended to Russell Jakes. He's now 2.6 uh, seconds ahead of him. There is a class battle going on here for Gareth Newton and Stephen Cakebread. Cakebread's gained three places so far in his new Ferrari. And Gareth Newton has gained 12 places in this race so far. Martin Kenyon asking about the weather. It is static weather morning at the moment, so it's nice and cold. The organisers do like a, uh, a cool track temperature. Makes things a little bit easier for the drivers. They do have a great ethos of wanting to welcome in some inexperienced and newer drivers to GT3 racing amongst this championship, which is great. And they follow on with that and make things a little bit easier with some cooler temperatures. Christoph Demai into the pits here, Ed. He was involved in that battle with drivers in a different class to him, as we see Nathan Crook having a bit of an off-track in the background. Uh, probably a good shout here by Christoph Demai to get out of that and then try and give himself another chance to get some clear air after a stop and jump them in the pits. Yeah, well, it does depend, obviously, on where he comes out onto the circuit after this pit stop, of course could find yourself out of the frying pan and into the fire in certain cases because there are close battles up and down the field they'll be hoping to get into a little pocket of space though where he can just focus on the lap times and trying to leapfrog those around him Johan Stitchbury now who's been having a great season so far off the back of a race victory at Sebring now trying to hang on to this sixth position Thomas Pugh in behind and let's not count out Thomas either from a great finish because he managed to get up ahead of Yanis Alba right at the very end of the race to get up into second place in his Lamborghini so he's been having a great season as well yeah it was fantastic that battle at the end both of these guys really benefiting from a lot of the fighting that was going on around them it's lovely to see them on track together just a week later I can't believe that was only a week ago actually though because I've done so much house moving and rubbish furniture lifting since then that it's quite, uh, it feels like it's been about three weeks since we've done one of these broadcasts. But still, a lot of time was, uh, a lot of fun was had at Sebring, it has to be said. 
very exciting race night. Uh, the classes are actually behaving themselves at the moment. If you look at the overall standings, we've got a big chunk of the elite drivers, then a big chunk of the premier class, and then just as you get to the Evo class, there's a few of the premiers and the elites mixed in there, but I think pit stops have actually been to blame for that. Gary Mitchell standing out at the moment as one of the premier class drivers, but let's not forget he had that incident earlier on which has put him back a few places amongst the Evo guys, but it shows you just not just on paper, but it actually works out really well, their, uh, their class division, as we've got more cars into the pits. There it is. Wonderful to see so much action. The classes as well battling together with each other. Obviously, we've got a huge gaggle of premier class cars all together at this moment in time. I think Joe Spara once again in the mix, but they're all coming into the pits now for what we presume to be their first of two stops. In tonight's race, just got Jan Stitchbury up on the jacks, and now we can focus on this battle between Jane Tahara and Marcel Brayton back. Quad Dash Racing versus Barbecue Bread Racing. Or, well, I think their main sort of contender potentially for this battle, Tristan Ingalls, that has already come into the pit, so maybe Tristan's hoping to have some clearer circuit when he comes back out onto the track. And it just allows these two to battle and slow each other down, which doesn't seem to be the case at the moment, Chaz. They might be working together, you know, to save a bit of fuel. Yeah, you never know. Some, at some points of a race like this, there's no point battling. We've both seen it before in other GT championships with hour-long races. You need to just save the fuel where you can and, and elongate the race in terms of your track time. Obviously, all the time that you're in the pits is time that you're going slowly or time that you're losing to other people. So the point of these is not just to be quick on track, but also to be on track as long as possible and in the pits as short as possible as well. We've got these three together here, the P-Tech GP2 cars of James Bostock and Hussein at Saraka Desla with Dave Russell behind as well, still the highest mover in the field, 28 places gained. James Bostock actually in the Porsche just ahead has got 21, Gary Mitchell's got 21, Ashley Brooks for Glass Tech Racing after starting in the back of the pack, he's got 25. Race leaders into the pits here, Ed, and in great flying formation, the RDS Sports cars pop up over the hill with Yanis Albert in tow. Here we go. I think this is when we see pretty much the rest of the field making their pit stops now. There's a sign that, of course, they aren't making it to the halfway point of the race, so we'll be needing to make one final sort of splash and dash with around about eight to ten minutes to go in the race. You can see Yanis have a shifting gears for no reason at all. <laughs> no benefit. No benefit whatsoever. Going up into his pit box. And is he gonna, are we going to see him get onto the jacks for some tyres? No. No, whereas all of the other Porsches around him have. So mm. maybe it's a case of Yanis opting again for what we saw at Sebring, which is not taking tyres, instead just getting sort of keeping the heat in them, I suppose, not worrying about yeah. cold tyres. You can hear the RDSA guys revving the, like you said, they called them before, the, uh, the Dogs Unmentionables off. But no, Yannis Albert doesn't really gain anything from that. Luke Lacasey holds on to his race lead. Ryan Otten's going well as well, by the way, in the Alpha 1 Esports Porsche. Can't forget about that. Ryan's had another ups, up and down season, it should be said. He's been very, very quick, but he's had the odd incident or spin here and there that's taken away the uh, the results and sort of made the uh, the results sheets look a bit unfair on him. Jamie Reese was going really well at a previous round. He's still up there inside the top 10 out right now, just ahead of Jean McLuhan. I think he's jumped Jean in the pits, actually with that. Jan Stitchery and Thomas Pugh still in front of them. Gianni Terha still in front of Marcel Breitenbach as well after their pit stops. We'll show you the stops on the left hand side so you can see that everybody now has done one initial pit stop. We've got a bunch of cars still coming out of the pit lane. We'll see how they all filter out. Martin Kenyon saying the stream is looking great. I do apologise. I had to ask though in the chat because I, there was a weird sort of warning before as if the bit rate had dropped and it had died but it seemed like it was just something that, uh, at my end that was incorrectly being displayed. So I do apologise. Hope it's still looking good, though. Like I said earlier, we've uh, we've upped the bit rate a lot in the, uh, the last sort of two weeks because of having a lovely full fibre connection now, which has certainly helped out. So, big battle going on here. Stephen Cape Red and Joe Glass side by side. Joe continuing to gain places as ooh, they get mighty close together down this back straight. Stephen Cape running the Ferrari and Stephen Donnelly getting a view of this from the Mercedes. Listen to this thing roar. It's great, isn't it, Ed? 
Fucking wonderful, wonderful sounding bit of kit. You can hear him just backing off a little bit as these two go side by side over head. And to be fair, I don't blame him. There's still halfway to go in this race. He's actually going to maybe benefit now as he gets underneath the Corvette bridge alongside the Porsche. Stephen Donnelly trying to go get to head with Joe Glass. He's got a little bit of his car ahead, but actually he's going to keep the momentum around the outside. What a lovely move by Stephen. He see backed off a little bit mm. in towards the left hander as they were going side by side up ahead, knowing that he was in the perfect position to try and gain a benefit at the end. Yeah, great respect as well by the drivers there. They, uh, they knew when to back out, when to pick the fight, so to speak, and not have an incident. This battle's still going on, though. Thomas Pugh, Jan Stitchbury, and Jamie Reese in the Porsche, all chasing one another down. Jamie, after that pit stop, has actually sort of been brought closer into this fight. Like I said, he jumped Jean McLuhan in the pits earlier on. So he's going to be feeling confident now that he can go forward and attack these guys as well. Thanks very much for the, uh, the kind words, everyone. I'm glad the stream is looking tasty can put it this way when I was broadcasting about a year ago actually uh, I was only using a bitrate of about 8,000 kilobytes a second I only had about nine megabytes up on uh, or megabits up on my uh, my connection now we've got over a hundred so we're going to use it I'm going to pay for I'm going to use what I've paid for basically getting 900 down and 100 up now which I'm much happier with instead of getting like 30 down and nine up so we'll take it Jamie Reese is just waiting here, though, Ed, for Jan Stitchbury to have a go at this Lamborghini and get held up, isn't he? There's a little glimpse of what he wants, making Jan go defensive. But he's got to be careful because John McLuhan will also pounce on him if he overdoes it as well. This is a tricky place to be in, isn't it, if you're Jamie Reese or even Jan Stitchbury, to be fair? Damned if you do, damned if you don't, really, in these scenarios because you know that you're not going to gain anything if you don't try for it. But at the same time, if you do try for it, it doesn't come off. Like you say, it's going to be in the perfect position to lose out so at this moment in time I think Jamie's just going to be waiting for a mistake from Yarm or anything else maybe having a little half look here and there to force the Welsh driver into potential compromised line a little bit of an area it's a nice run here in towards Canada corner but I don't know if he's actually going to properly have a look for a position instead going to just maybe throw off Yarm again for making Yarm go Oof. defensive Very to the inside so close together at the same time, doesn't want to force Yarn to go defensive into every corner because they're going to lose out to Thomas Pugh. Got a good battle going on here, actually. A bunch of drivers all very, very close together. We've got Joe Glass in the Porsche. He's got Matt Hoyland right behind him. Stephen Donnelly just in front. Then Gary Mitchell, then Stephen Capebread in all of this. This quintet of cars having a good old scrap. I think uh, Xavier Talavera has just had a bit of a drama further up. But we'll stick with this for now because Joe Glass wants to move forward get amongst these guys but oh goodness me Matt Hoyland is so close to the back of him here in his fellow Porsche both of these guys in the same class in the Premier Division you can see great awareness there by Hoyland just to break that a little bit earlier and just make sure that there was an extra bit of space between him and the car he's chasing we've got Gareth Newton and Jacob Collier just behind the Sumo Racing Lamborghini and then the Privateer Audi as well Ed Junker saying, first time watching this, what great coverage and racing. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, my friend. Glad you're enjoying the show. Going forward, one position here. Stephen Donnelly is now really close to Gary Mitchell. Joe Glass is really close to the back of Stephen Donnelly. More slipstream going on here, Ed. Three different cars as well. The Ferrari leading the Mercedes and the Porsches. And all of them have their own strengths and weaknesses. But that Merc, I mean, it used to be a missile in a straight line when the first version came to iRacing. And it looked like it had a real bomb under the bonnet then, didn't it? Flipping heck, it was flying really really quick that thing in a straight line but then as soon as it pulled out to the inside to try and take the position it just lost all grunt and that's probably because the Ferrari there is getting a little bit of slipstream itself gaining mm. some time on the cars ahead Mitchell chasing down Cape Bread so essentially why that Mercedes isn't quite as rapid as we're expecting it to be go two Porsches there duking it out in behind nice and clean battling though which is what we want to see isn't it Chaz yeah, I think uh, Matt Hoyland there, he's been putting so much pressure on Joe. Joe's just said, you know what, mate, off you pop. You know, you go by. I don't want to lose too much time to the guys behind. You may be, well, he, he could be hoping that Matt Hoyland is a bit of a key to unlock the door here in front because there's a few Premier Class drivers. Matt is seemingly a bit quicker than them as well. I mean, he's closed straight up to the back of Stephen Donnelly in just two corners, and he's definitely on a bit of a mission here. We've seen him higher up in the races. He's lost 15 places from where he started, so we know that on paper he's definitely capable of being a bit further up 
Uh, looking at the Evo class lead, though, it is only half a second, and it's actually in the favour of Russell Jakes now. He's ahead of Graham Matthew. Now, I'm pretty sure he did that in the pits because he was three seconds shorter in the pit lane than Graham. So, Russell Jakes in the Porsche taking the lead in the Evo class. A great job, but Graham Matthew, he's not letting him get away here, is he, Ed? It's just a case of keeping your head in these scenarios and chipping away at the gaps. Yeah, and that's literally all it's about, isn't it? Just keeping your head down, focusing not too much on what's around you, making those incremental gains over the course of a race. And because the races are hour long, those little gains can add up to a whole lot come the end of the race. So I think that's what these drivers are needing to focus on is the bigger picture. And so Graham Matthew doing a great job of doing exactly that right at this moment in time. Love riding on board with the Lamborghini here. Making such a fantastic racket. 5.2 litre V10 engine shared with the engine in the Audi R8 LMS GT3 car as well. Shared with the road cars that they also are based on. Graham Matthew just ploughing his way down the back straight here towards turn three. they will be hard on the brakes now to go down through the gears. Big clunk and a drop as it heads down over the kerb. Tidy stuff, isn't it, by Graham at the moment? You get the sense that... He's not trying to push the car too hard. It's not weaving around all over the place. It's not bobbling around. He's just keeping this thing in check, isn't he? He's playing the long game. Yeah, he's doing exactly what needs to be done at this moment in time. Of course, he was leading the Evo class for a majority of the race. He's now lost out to Russell Jacques, but still can see the car up ahead. And I think with the pit stops, they say a slight difference in time. You can imagine that Graham Matthews is going to make that up later on as Gary Mitchell now trailing the pressure and is going to concede the inside line through the carousel just trying to keep the momentum around the outside but it's so difficult because the corner goes on for ages and ages and ages it hoping that it's going to be over and over soon oh. for Gary Mitchell's sake but that won't be the case and now Matt Hyland with the inside line through this kink oh it's my not goodness gonna me. make the move whoa look at Gary Mitchell hanging it around the outside now towards Camden Corner they're still too wide Maybe even three wide as we can see Stephen Donnelly fancy in a piece of the action. No, Stephen's just waiting in the wings to see if this all goes. <laughs> Bear shape for these two. Once more, still side by side. The outside line will then become the inside line for the Ferrari. He has to break Whoa. just to avoid contact <laughs> and loses out. What bravery that was from Matt Hoyland to keep it going around the outside as flipping it. <laughs> Joe Glass nearly making the error of all errors in the midst of this battle. Look. Keeping it going, Jacob Collier as well. Now, I'll tell you what. Into the picture. Oh, that was a scary few <laughs> moments. <laughs> I was going to say, Gary Mitchell's had his tea cakes. Flip it in heck. Hold on to your tea cakes, everybody. That was remarkable racing between those two side by side for so many corners. And not just any corners either. Very terrifying, high speed, narrow corners here at Road America. Great stuff. Joe Glass making it really clear that he wants to get past Donnelly as well. Moving around quite a lot behind him. We need to look at this though because Jamie Rees and Thomas Pugh have had a bit of a scrap here and Thomas has actually lost out. Thomas got past him actually and then Jamie got back in front of him. So something going on here. Jean McLuhan has also been involved in that scrap. We've got also more battle in here with Talavera who's got a very damaged car actually. He went off the circuit a few laps ago and has come back on and now is ooh, seemingly in the way there. This is what happened. Is he going to just clip the grass or is he just going to have a bit of an off at the carousel? Oh, the back end got away from him there, and it's just gradually going, going, going. I'm wondering how he got all that damage. Dave Russell, after having such a great race so far, has unfortunately just had a big drama. Um, this is what happened to Talavera. This is how he got his damage. Right up behind James Bostock. What on earth has gone on here? He's come... He's on the outside of the Porsche, still on the outside of the Porsche. Hmm. Not quite sure. Oh! Oh, it was literally just as we joined them, actually, that that, that damage had happened. Quite funnily <laughs> enough. Uh, this is what happened with Dave Russell. He was side by side with the 108 machine, the Porsche. There's, oh, no. Oh, no. That's Sarah Kadesla. That's a colossal impact. Two of them just sort of bounced off wheels, of, well, bounced off each other's wheels, didn't they, as they came out of the left-hander just ahead of Talavera. You see, look, there, they get together and then, oh, they just keep bouncing, and that is a sickening impact. 
And Talavera loses his rear wing as a result. Yeah, and then you can really feel it through that carousel, can't you? You can see oh. the rear end not playing ball whatsoever. And Talavera already bit battered and bruised before then, but that has really just sealed him into the pit lane. Hopefully we'll see him continue on, try and score some points in of the evening. Going stitch Brio, looking at his fight up in the elite class. They have lost a little bit of ground to Ryan Ottens just up ahead. Mm. Jamie Rees and Thomas Pugh, though, still battling away. Yeah, Yanis Albert still trying to chase down the race leaders, the lead trio. Once again, the RDSA Esports cars. Luke the Casey now 1.2 seconds ahead of Tristan Dino Brega. Tristan's just had a bit of a moment, actually, out the final corner and lost a bunch of time down the start-finish straight. He's 3.6 seconds ahead of Troy Dolinchek. To be fair, Troy doesn't need to do a massive amount here tonight. He's got a great lead in the championship. He's got no reason to overdo it. He just needs to continually score points and not put himself under too much pressure. Here is Russell Jakes leading the way in the Evo class. He's just been overtaken by Jack Pierre Mohammed for overall position, but Jack is in the elite class. And after earlier dramas, he's trying to just recuperate his position. He's 11th in class at the moment in the elite lineup. But it's Russell Jakes, Graham Matthew, and Stephen Catebread, your top three in the Evo class. And in the Premier class, we have Gianni Terha still leading the way in the Porsche. Marcel Brighton back second in the Ferrari, and then Tristan Engelstad in the Mercedes next up, actually. It's the only class, actually, that's got all three cars on the podium in the same manufacturer, anyway, is the, uh, the RDS Esports cars in the Elite class. All the other classes have three different manufacturers, which is great to see. But another solid performance this so far by Gianni Terha as we go into the final third of the race here, Ed. He's been... Almost untouchable again. He had to make his uh, had to had to work for it though, didn't he? You know, he didn't start at the front of the class itself, no. so he's had to gain those places. Yeah, he certainly has done. But again, his consistency in staying out of trouble in the early phase of the race, I think, is what really helps out him in these situations. Same with actually his teammate Tristan Engelstad. Those two quad dash racing drivers are where they are in the teams championship and also in the premier standings for a very good reason. That is their sort of unwavering consistency we saw it from round one up until now that they've pretty much always been on the podium i can't think of a time when they've had a bad result to be fair Chaz. it's been pretty pretty consistent for them which is what you need to do and that's what wins championships of course it's not necessarily winning rounds and then having a crash they're winning around then having a crash it's the constant presence up on the podium that is what can seal the deal yeah definitely we've seen it a few times that you know, there's drivers that over here in the UK, for any of you that are watching from outside of it, we, we have the British Touring Car Championship here and one of the most successful drivers of all time is a gentleman called Colin Turkington. And we call it doing a Turkington because he's never really the most exciting driver to watch, but he's just there scoring points, scoring points, scoring points, and he's won four titles because of that. You know, he's, he's amazing. Really, really amazing driver. Or is it three titles? I think it's four, isn't it? But still, the way that he does it is what makes it so impressive. It's not flamboyant, it's not over the top, he's just there scoring points. Look at this run by Matt Hoyland here on Stephen Cakebread. We're looking at a Premier Class driver against Evo, so on paper there will be a difference, but that run that Matt got through there was just an example of the commitment mm. that you can take and the slight difference as well that just gains you those tenths on a lap. Hoyland is really flying, to be fair. And what have we said about the potential elite class victory as well Tristan Dino Brega losing out to Luke Lucchese well he's managed to gain back that time on the last lap and mm. it's come down now to less than a second between the two RDSA Esports teammates for first and second into the final 18 minutes worth of racing we could have an interesting little battle on our hands definitely could we've got another one in the elite class as well Jan Stitchbury still not been able to get away from Jamie Rees Jamie was actually half a tenth of a second slower on that previous lap, but this time round he started to really pile the pressure onto the back of the Mercedes. All this time they've got Thomas P waiting in the wings. We know he's good at that. He did it really well at Sebring and took second place in the final race of the night with an awesome overtake at the end and a really good run on Yanis Albert. Yanis is having another sort of under-the-radar performance here, but he's in fourth place, scoring big, big points. And that's what he needs for his championship to try and chase down Troy Dolinchek, just hoping 
that the South African has some sort of misfortune. Obviously, we'd never wish that on any of our competitors, but for your own sake, as a driver yourself, you would sometimes hope that that's how it could go for somebody else. Christelle de Mai and Marcel Breitenbach are having a scrap here. In different classes, well entitled to race each other if they want to, but Breitenbach, ooh, I was going to say backing out of that one, but I think it was more just to keep the car to the apex for a minute there. Manages to get in front, and through goes the BMW driver. Christoph de Mai has consistently been the driver in the elite class that's having to sort of make a comeback drive, isn't he, unfortunately, Ed? We've had him up there quite a lot, but it's always as a result of having a poor start or having an incident early on. Yeah, and I think in this case it was just he didn't quite get the qualifying performance he was looking for at the moment. He's currently sitting in exactly the same position that he qualified in, so part of the reason why we see Christoph down where he is at this moment in time is just his qualifying wasn't to the level that I think he was hoping for and we were expecting from him. Mm. But, of course, there's still ways to go in the race, but the cars up ahead of him are a good few seconds up the road. He needs to make up six and a half seconds to Jean McLuhan and then also pass him. And with 16 minutes to go in the race, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to see Christoph De Mai really get anywhere higher in his class than 10th position at this moment. Now it's quite unlikely, unfortunately, with the quality of the field that we've got. It's amazing how close all of them are, really, on pace. Speaking of being close, Jamie Reese under a massive amount of pressure now from that Lamborghini there of Thomas Pugh, the bar barbecue bread racing machine. Dipping this way and that way. One of the many South African drivers we have in the race, actually, that are all near the front of the order. There's six of them in the field, and they're all inside the top 12 positions. Three of them in the top three. So this influx of the South African drivers that have come across have been very impressive. But well, Jamie Reese actually opened up a bit of a gap on Thomas there. That just shows you, doesn't it, Ed, how important it is to get that run, not just out of the carousel, but into it as well, to get the speed already built up before the corner. It's all about the way you approach the corners, while also battling with the cars. It's so difficult when you're in the midst of these battles to get the line right, especially if you've got a car right up ahead of you, because, of course, you want to open up the corner, but at the same time, if you take a little bit too much speed into the corner, you've got to sort of back away to not run to the back of the car ahead. It's so difficult to try and manage and focus on the corner exits and the entry speeds as well when you're also close to cars in and around you. You can't also afford too much space to the inside while you want to open up the corner. If you've got a car right behind you, you need to be aware of the fact that you're leaving the door wide open to move up the inside. Jack Pierre Mohammed okay. has just overtaken Joe Shapara for overall position. But as we saw earlier, Jack is in the elite class and Joe is in the premier class. So in terms of their championship points, not making a colossal amount of difference there. But Jack doing what he can for Lud Crook Racing at the moment. He's unfortunately down in 11th place, but he had that earlier incident. So that's what's knocked him down there. The results sheet won't tell the full story. But there's battles throughout the order. And another quick moment to thank our championship sponsors, Kame, Medius, AB Designs and Keenan Eco Energy. Thanks also to the Evolution Sim Racing Championship or GT3 Championship organisers for having us on board here at Chance Drake Up Media. This is round six of the championship that you watch here, everybody. And we really do hope you're enjoying yourselves. Thank you to all of you that have popped along so far. Thanks to everyone that's liked and, of course, subscribed as a result of this series. It really does mean a lot. The channel actually hit 3,000 subscribers just the other day, which I'm delighted about over the moon about it and the growth continues to be very very solid and i believe it was january 23 when i hit 1000 subscribers so it's going well it's going well and i'm really enjoying it and hopefully these streams help out as oh there was a car off in the background there and it wasn't the one i thought it was it was alex kunrats for the ptec gp2 team i think he just dipped a wheel on the grass and the gravel on the exit of that curb ed it's i'm surprised we've not seen that a little bit more actually because it's very easy to do this have a look here at Kunrats. Just in towards turn two. Oh, it's the inside. Hooking a couple of wheels on the inside there, and it's just I'm not sure if it was maybe the bump of the curb or if it was just a couple of wheels onto the grass and putting the power down. The lack of traction you get causes the inside wheel to spin and then send it around, unfortunately. I'd like to point out, White Van Gaming um, corrected me the other day when I hit 3,000 3, subscribers. I said, flipping heck, it was only January 2022 when I did that. No, it was January 2023 when I uh, when I did that. I thought I was 
another year in. But no, it turns out it's happened quicker than I imagined. As Ashley Brooks, whoa, way too hot into the left-hander there. He just clipped the grass on the way in. And it's lost a little bit of time as a result. We go forward to Matt Hoyland, who continues to move also forward. He's got James Pallet in the Ferrari in front of him. James will be happy to still be running, actually, because he was in a very dangerous position earlier, halfway around the carousel, with nobody hitting him. Look at the run again. We saw Hoyland do this earlier, didn't we? Fantastic run through there, around the outside of the Ferrari, through all of the left kinks, and he's going to break that a little bit later, use the inside line. Great stuff by Matt Hoyland, the DXT Motorsports car, going really, really well. Back to this again, though, Ed. We've got 12 minutes this race remaining. Probably some more pit stops still to come. Maybe some splash and dashes, I'm not quite sure. But these guys still having a good old ding-dong here. Yian Stitchery's not been able to get away. No, he hasn't, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's the end for Yian because we saw, while he wasn't able to get away at the end of the race at Sebring, as, ooh, Jamie Rees running very wide, mm -hmm. and that's going to open the door wide for Whoa. Thomas Pugh. But... <laughs> Commitment. Neck. Tea commitment cakes. and a half there. <laughs> Look got at a good pair of tea cakes on him there. Oh, isn't it? Mighty. Look at the tea cakes on Jamie Reese. Flipping heck, sunshine. I always wondered why they made the interior of the Porsche bigger. Flipping heck, it was absolutely the commitment there was unbelievable. That was incredible commitment. Thomas Pugh then gets the run. This is how it all looked. You can see Jamie's just committed on the throttle a little bit too early. Car understeers. Thomas, fair play to him, gives him loads of room, gets out of that, and look, round the outside, the Porsche just screams on by. That was fantastic. Unfortunately, Ashley Brooks, after having his dramas earlier on and having a little bit of uh, over-exuberance, oh, has had contact, actually. Straight on, and into the wall he goes. Wow. So who was that that he was fighting with? I think Xavier Talavera. Right together, down the start, finish straight. Talavera goes to the right-hand side. Ashley starts coming over to the right, and he's just bounced off him. That was Schumacher and Villeneuve mm. vibes right there, wasn't it? That was like Jerez. Yeah. I was just saying that Ashley turns it a bit too early. There's a lot of mm. circuit still to the left-hand side, and could have waited a little while longer before trying to make the move to take the corner. So it came into the side of the Ferrari and came off second best, unfortunately. Second best... Was Second best to Luke Lucchese. At this moment in time is Tristan Dinabrega. You can see his teammate just in behind now. Luke Lucchese leading the race since the very start of the race, since the drop of the green flag. And hopefully to see a lights the flag victory. Tristan Dinabrega, though, has been slowly but surely trying to chip away at that advantage. Lap after lap. That has been coming down. But with a little mistake like that, you might lose out a little bit of time with less than 10 minutes to go in this race every single lap every single corner has to be perfect for tristan to really close up to his teammate and rifle we've only got four drivers out of the race so far javier talavera is now out of the race for howl motorsport ashley brooks out of the race as well hussein sarah kadesla and matthew jones two of the glass tech racing cars p tech gp2 and howl motorsport like i say just the four cars out of the race so from the 44 cars that we had on the grid at the start of this race and with just less than well now nine minutes left to go it's Lucchese leading the way in the elite class Taha leading the premier class and it is still Russell Jakes leading in the Evo division but he's still got Graham Matthew right on his tail here Ed there's not been more than a second between these guys for ages has there no there really hasn't so we're gonna see if uh, Graham Matthew is able to close up that gap and overtake Russell Jack I expect in drivers to make another pit stop though, aren't we, Chas? Because we did see them come in around about the... With about 34 minutes to go in the race, I think the majority of the field came in at that sort of period. So we're expecting pit stops sooner rather than later, I think. Definitely. I think we will get the, the last sort of batch of drivers coming in. Or we'll get the sort of last gasp pit stops now. I'm surprised, actually, that they've managed to make it last as long as they have here at Road America because most of the circuit is start finish straights or well they're not all start finish straights but you know what I mean long straights and very high acceleration zones you can't really save much fuel here unless you're right behind somebody and utilising slipstream to do so we look here once again at Jamie Reese still in front of the Lamborghini of Thomas Pugh after that amazing commitment earlier on around the outside of the kink 
little lick of flame there from the back of the Porsche as well as he pops up through the gears. You can see though he's on the brakes to try and make it work. He's not got the sort of confidence that Thomas Pugh's got around there in the Lamborghini, but Lambo is quite an oversteery little car. So I'm wondering whether there are certain machines, especially the mid-engined of them, that do have a slight advantage around there, you know. Yeah, it's difficult to know. I can't say I've um, driven the car too much to know exactly where the car strengths are. I know, obviously, the way the weight's positioned, it can put its power down very nicely. It sort of hunkers down the and gets on with its business. But I just think because of its weight distribution, it's also got that instability about it. Could also be a maybe detriment. At the moment, Jamie Rees hanging on. And closing up to Jan Stitchbury. Thomas Pugh in the barbecue bread racing Lamborghini. Sticking with him as well. This battle has been going on for pretty much most of the racing. <laughs> Thomas Pugh gives a little look to the inside, doesn't he? And towards mm. turn one. Just to throw off South Africa more than anything else. And wonderful stuff there by Tony on that's Owen Seward. I think trying to get oh. out of the way. But oh, <laughs> I thought he was going to get out of the way of all of them. Never <laughs> mind. He... Thinks about it and then thinks better of it. Now he's going to stick to oh, one in the no. circuit, but now that's causing these drivers to go side by side. The better thing to have done uh, was just to lift off completely and yeah. just let these three pass, but it's given us a great little battle. The two of them side by side is Thomas Pugh going to get the better Jamie Rees or is Jamie's commitment oh, Jamie. going to be the better? <laughs> oh, no! Oh, he's overcommitted. The two cars come to blows on the exit. And I'm not sure if that was maybe just the case of Jamie just trying to close off the avenue around the outside a little bit too much, or if yeah. there was a little gap that was always going to close that maybe Thomas Pugh was sticking his nose into where it didn't belong. I don't know. Here's how it went. So he had to get on the brakes twice here, look, just to not hit the back of the Lamborghini. Eventually gets the run. Thomas Pugh, as opportunistic as ever, just like he did at Sebring. But then, look, the Lamborghini on the left doesn't even lift there, and Jamie Reese is close to hitting him. It's fantastic stuff on the brakes by Jamie, but I think he just doesn't quite get rid of the overlap on the exit of the corner. The camera goes a bit funny there, sorry. But look, he doesn't quite get rid of it there, and there is still a touch. And to be honest, I don't think there's really much that Thomas Pugh's done wrong there. I think Jamie, unfortunately, has to blame himself for that one. The overlap was not gone, and he used all of the road. Graham Matthew has gone off from second place in the Evo class, gets back on again. But that is not ideal. He was doing so well at chasing down Russell Jakes, but Russell now has over three seconds to the good. So that's going to give him a lot more comfort in the later stages of the race. Someone that won't have a lot more comfort in the later stage of the race, I'm sure you've just noticed as well, Ed, is our race leader, mm. Luke Lucchese. He's got his teammate right behind him. Yeah, Christian Dunabrega really catching up now. I think he's noticing that it's the dying stage of the race so he's going to really go for it against his teammate put him under pressure and see if this will be the difference maker that will take the race victory away from his teammate fair credit to luke he's led pretty much from the word go up until now and it'd be heartbreaking for him to lose out after well 55 maybe 58 minutes worth of leading the race but it doesn't matter how many laps you lead it only matters that you lead the final one when the checkered flag has fallen Absolutely. Great to see the two teammates chasing each other down, though. Christoph de Mai has just come into the pit lane, by the way. Are we going to be... Is that a drive-through? I think that's a drive-through for incident points for Christoph de Mai. He has not stopped in the box, so, yeah. Unfortunately, the Frenchman's race gets that little bit worse, and he has to drop back out. He's still ahead of Jack Pierre Mohamed, though, in his class, so he's not actually lost a position. But it's just the overall position that he loses. So I just meant in class, sorry. Jani Terha well, continues another very impressive run here at Road America, leading the way for Quad Dash Racing. His teammate Tristan Engelstad is third in class. They've got Marcel Brayton back between them. Nathan Crook is only 1.6 seconds back, actually, from Tristan. So he's going to be trying everything he can to close in in the later stages. Not even sure they're going to need another pit stop here, you know, Ed. They've all done... A mighty fine job here. I don't remember if we had two stops or just the one at Road... Uh, sorry, at Circuit of the Americas. I thought we had two. Um, not sure. <laughs> I can't remember. There was that much <laughs> going on. As Oh, Rob Mackay goes off on the right-hand side of the circuit. He's trying to get past Wesley Van Rens there, who's now 32nd outright, 6th in his class. Matt Hoyland amongst these guys. 
But Rob just overdoes it, I'm afraid, on the kerb. Slows down a little bit too much. Car over rotates. And it does itself in. I love this uh, Escuderia Panthera car of Wesley Van Ren's. Great looking Ferrari. Makes his way up the hill. Car number 99. And he's got Matt Hoyland right behind him now. He might just let Matt go. Oh, goodness me, maybe not. I was going to say he might let Matt go here, but Matt had a bit of a moment of his own. Pushing like mad is Mr. Hoyland. Thomas Pugh still attacking now. Jan Stitchbury after Jamie Reese has dropped down because of the earlier incident. We're going to be starting the final lap next time round, and it's still Luke Lacasey leading the way. So, yeah, it doesn't look like we are going to get the uh, the second stops. We predicted earlier that we may get them, but unless there's been a change to the the fuel limit or something along the way, still, we carry on. I know all the guys will be very, very excited about the potential battles they've got ahead of them. So we've got Jan Stitchbury and Thomas Pugh here right together. That's the number 76 car trying to stay out of the way. That was Chris Keenan for MRC 493. Jamie Reese and Marcel Breitenbach are close together, but Marcel not racing him for class position. Alex Fretwell and James Bostock are close together. The Racing League Hub Ferrari and the P-Tech GP2 Porsche. Gary Mitchell and Jacob Collier, both fans of metallic stripy cars by the look of it. They're currently in 25th and 26th. James Rankin just ahead of John Ludbrook here coming down the start finish straight. And then we saw earlier Wesley Van Rens and Matt Hoyland close together. But we'll stick with this. A little bit further up the order. Iron Stitchbury now under pressure from Thomas Pugh. That Lamborghini really rattling along now down towards Canada Corner. He's only going to get one more opportunity at this onto the final lap of the race. Tries it around the outside. Doesn't quite keep the overlap, though. That gives Yian all the comfort, comfort, I should say, that he needs to stay ahead. But we're on to the final lap now for Luke Lucchese. Just coming out of turn one with Tristan Dino Brega next to him. And these two have had an amazing, amazing run once again, Ed. But what's happened here to Alex Kernrats? Alex Kernrats in towards the final corner. Is he going to... Maybe just overdo it on the way into the corner. A bit too much speed. And then the over-rotation. The classic Porsche spin. Yep. As you do recover it, but again, if you just take a little bit too much speed in that thing, especially actually in that car and also the Lamborghini, it has the tendency just to get the over rotation that sends him to a spin. Unfortunate, but easily done. So it's an RDSA Sports 1 2 3 at the moment. Troy Dolinchek will not be too upset with finishing in third place if that's where he ends up because he will have still extended his championship lead over the man in fourth place, Yanis Albert. Yanis, again, very consistent today, but once he'd been overtaken by Troy, Troy, unfortunately for his sake, just disappeared. We've got Fretwell Bostock Demai is in there as well now. The BMW is caught up to James Bostock's Porsche. As oh, what on earth was that for Christoph? He seemingly lifted off for a second there. Lost a load of time. I thought maybe he'd run out of fuel or something, but no, seemingly not. Uh, the gap is getting smaller at the front, by the way. <laughs> Tristan Dino Brega has now brought this down to three tenths of a second. The clock is, well, I was going to say it's hit zero, but it's hit zero and continued to click to one. I've still not figured out why it's doing that. But these guys, I think, are maybe going to go in flying formation here. I'm not sure. Let's not forget that it's been Troy Dolinchek winning pretty much all the races so far. Both of his teammates that we see here on screen have both been doing an epic, epic job. Round in, round out. Luke Lucchese had hard luck last time round at Sebring, but as he rounds the final corner here at Road America in round six of the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship, Lucchese is going to take his first win of the season. Tristan Dino Brega is in second, and it is indeed a lovely flying formation finish for RDSA Esports. Great stuff, lads. Great, great result. Troy Dolinchek locks out the podium with a 1-2-3. Yanis Albert finishes in fourth position. And we look a bit further back to see Jan Stitchbury and Thomas Pugh right together till the very end here, Ed. Lamborghini versus Mercedes. Yeah, and the Lamborghini's going to get a nice exit here, but the grunt of the Mercedes just looks so up to the line, up the hill. It's going to be enough for Jan to hold on to that sixth position, but a lovely battle between the pair of them. Really great, respectful stuff across the board. Wonderful, wonderful race from the pair of them. And then we can go down to the Premier Class and see... Gianni Taha, who's going to come over the line to win the Premier Class, just ahead of Marcel Brayton back there. You can see in the barbecue bread racing Ferrari, second place. And then the quad dash racing teammate of Premier Class winner, Gianni Taha, Tristan Engelstad, taking home the Premier Class victory there. And now, Russell Jacques, he's not out of the woods yet because look who's right behind Matthew is still chasing him down. 
Yep, two of them right together. It's been a really solid recuperation here by Graham Matthew. Certainly caught up really quickly to the back of this Porsche, but I don't quite think he's going to get there. Russell just needs to keep it together for one more corner. And I tell you what, Graham has really piled that pressure on. But it's going to be Russell Jakes that takes the win in car seven in round six of the championship. Great drive by the MRC 493 driver. Graham Matthew second. Well done to both of those guys as they fly past Jack Pierre Mohammed. And Stephen Catebread, his first race in the Ferrari, and he scores a third place finish in class. Sorry, that music was very loud then, everybody. I do apologise. <laughs> More cars finishing and completing the race. That's Gareth Newton in the Lamborghini. But another very enticing race there, Ed. Plenty of battles going on and inter-class battles as well, which was really good. Wonderful, wonderful race, wasn't it? Up and down the field. So many exciting little battles that we saw as well throughout the field. Those tense battles for class positions, of course. I mean, that battle that we saw between Jan Stitchbury and Thomas Pugh was wonderful, wasn't it? To see them all in the mix, fighting away. Jamie Rees as well, trying to get in the mix, but a little bit of a moment. Shame it didn't quite work out for him, but still, wonderful, wonderful race. Absolutely was. And this is how the elite class finished. Luke Lacasey takes the win. Tristan Dinobrega and Troy Dolinchek make it a 1-2-3 for RDSA Esports. Yanis Albert finishes fourth with Ryan Ottens in fifth. Jan Stitchbury was in sixth place ahead of Thomas Pugh in the barbecue bread racing Lamborghini. John McLuhan was then in eighth place ahead of Jamie Reese with Christoph Demai in tenth and Jack Pierre Mohammed finished in eleventh for Ludcrook Racing. Ed, take it away with the Premier Class. Thank you very much, Chaz. And it is Jai Taha that takes the victory for Quad Dash Racing head off Marcel Breitenbach, Barbecue Bread Racing, with Tristan Engelstad there, third place, rounding out the podium. Then we come to fourth, Matt Barnett, ahead of fifth place, Robin Aston. Sixth is Alex Fretwell with James Bostock, Nathan Crook, Joe Sparza, and Paul Robson rounding out your top ten. They have Gary Mitchell in 11th, ahead of Stephen Donnelly, 12th, James Rankin, 13th, ahead of Joe Glass, Matt Hoyland, Jacob Collier and then Jamal Gandor and Dave Russell 17th and 18th finishing one lap down with Javier Talavera and Hussein Sargadez and Matthew Jones finishing 19th, 20th and 21st. Then Chaz, you can take it away for the Evo class standings. Thank you very much. A close finish in the end between Russell Jakes and Graham Matthew. Just less than a quarter of a second between the two with Stephen Cakebread in third. John Ludbrook was next up ahead of Gareth Newton with Wesley Van Rens, the championship leader, is in sixth place in that one. He won't be too chuffed with that. Rob Mackay was in seventh with James Pallet in eighth. Alex Kernrats was a lap down. So too was Owen Seward and Chris Keenan. Ashley Brooks, unfortunately, out of the race due to the equal... Uh, sorry... Equal? No, the contact equaling a non-finish for him. So I couldn't quite get uh, <laughs> get my words out there. I do apologise. Uh, what we're going to do is go back in time, of course, as we always do. We're going to go to the green flag-ish, if Chaz can ever find it on here. We're going to slow things down. And we're going to have a look at some beautiful slow-mo shots here while we have a chat with some of the key drivers from the evening, the first of which is going to be Luke Lacasey, who took the race victory. Luke, welcome to the commentary box, mate. You must be over the moon, especially after Sebring, to get that first win. Yeah, no, I'm very, very happy with it. Um, but yeah, I, I seem to click with this track. I had good pace you know, through all the sessions that we did. So yeah, and it's, uh, it's worked out. Zero off tracks also. Oh, <laughs> You tasty man, what a fantastic drive that is. Um, what was the confidence level like going into tonight? Because even I know, you know, Ed and I both know that even after a little moment like you had at the end of Sebring, regardless of how close the battle was, it can it can knock your confidence a bit, can't it? Yeah, look, I mean, that was a it was a silly mistake. Um, you know, shouldn't have happened. <laughs> we should have communicated better. I mean, it wasn't intentional, but yeah, Ugh, it's racing. Things happen. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, we were we were concerned because the Lamborghini is actually quite quick here. Um, it's got a good front end, so you can actually bomb it into a corner, and, and it's got good rear end stability as well. I did, just wasn't sure of the tire life, so you know that was a, a, a concern. What our pace um, was going to be like, um, you know, versus the Lamborghinis, because Yanis is obviously super quick. But yeah, no, look, it all worked out. I got uh, pole by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll take it. 
I was going to say, it's remarkably close round here considering it's a two minute lap, isn't it? It's amazing the level of the pace of you guys at the front of the field. It must be really rewarding to race so closely in, in such a tight margin with everybody. Yeah, no, it is. Look, I mean, we got so we got the gap, myself and Tristan, so it was quite um, quite cool out front. Um, you know, we didn't have to push too hard. You know, you just run our laps, do consistent lap times, you know, not, not pushing the envelope. So, yeah, no, I think it was a very good team result. So, yeah, hopefully we can just carry this momentum forward. Definitely. And speaking of, it's going to be the final race in the Americas for this season uh, next week when we go to Gilles Villeneuve for two sprint races. How are you feeling about going there? Look, I like the track. Um, previous season, we were in um, the Audi, which struggled with um, exit traction. So hopefully the Porsche is a little bit better around there. But yeah, we'll, we'll plug away, do some more laps and, and see what we can do. Absolutely. Well, we hope it goes well for you, Luke. Is there anyone you'd like to give a shout out to before you go? I'd like to give a shout out to my folks because they don't miss a sim race. Oh, bless them. <laughs> so shout out to them. So thanks for watching, mom and dad. Excellent stuff, Luke. Well, great to speak to you, mate. Well done on the win, and we look forward to seeing you in a week. Have a good evening, man. Thanks. Cheers, man. Cheers, buddy. Well, there we go. Luke Lucchese takes his first win of the season, Ed. Like I said, a very straightforward drive for him, but the gap was it was like there was a bungee cord between him and Tristan, wasn't there? Yeah, it was. It was just constantly sort of ebbing and flowing this way and that way, and there was times where we thought, oh, Luke was going to run away with this, and then give it a couple laps. Tristan was right back in the mix. It's wonderful to... Watch very cagey affair, but same <laughs> didn't result in some excellent side-by-side -side racing. But maybe we get that next time. Well, hopefully we do. We move down to speak to the Evo class winner for tonight, Russell Jacks. Russell, congratulations. You must be over the moon with that one. It was a fight for until the very end with Graham, wasn't it? It was. It was. So when he, a um, couple of laps ago, he tried to move and kind of went straight on. And I thought, that's it. I've got it now. But he obviously the foot to the floor after that as I laid off that Porsche at the end the last few laps was um yeah pretty scary at points <laughs> I was gonna say there was there was definitely a moment where we could we, we imagined that you were maybe taking it a bit safer just to bring the win home but yeah you were uh, yeah. you're absolutely right Graham was on it near the end but it's one of it those was. it's one of those circuits isn't it Road America where you can try and attack it and it will sometimes bite back won't it yeah, I mean, I've been quite fortunate this week. I've um, done a lot of work on Road America this week. So um, I was off on Monday, so I did a lot of practice and kind of got the pace down um, after a coaching session with Yanis on Sunday. So um, pace up, sorry. So that was, that kind of helped. Um, kind of gave me the confidence coming into it tonight. But, you know, the practice race on Monday and I ended up wiping out in the first lap and taking about 12 people with me. So it was a bit panicky coming in tonight. <laughs> Fair play. Well, it certainly went well for you, mate, in the end, and obviously big championship points. Uh, how do you feel about uh, Gilles Villeneuve next week going to Montreal? Yeah, um, it's kind of back to normal from a working perspective again next week. So I'm actually away Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday next week. So that's going to be a challenge in getting practice in. But I'll have that coaching session on Sunday again and hopefully get enough practice in before to, to try and give it a go. But, you know, I missed Sebring last week because I was on holiday. So I knew that I had to score decent points tonight to pull myself back into that kind of championship um, run, if we like. Well, it's all a bigger picture, isn't it, at the end of the day, mate? It's been fantastic yeah. to watch you so far. And is there anybody you'd like to give a shout out to before you go? Yeah, a few people. So, um, firstly, teammates at MRC. So, I've only been sim racing, I think, for five months now. So, I was pretty horrific um, at the start, but they took me on and kind of helped me and um, got me doing some endurance races and so on, which helped. And then a massive shout out to Yanis Albert. Um, for the coaching sessions, he's definitely found some pace in me. Um, so yeah, long may it continue. Well, we wish the same as well, mate. Thank you very much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you next time round. Have a good one. Thank you. Cheers. Russell Jakes there taking his first win in the class this season, I believe there, Ed. And it's all about confidence going forward, isn't it? And when you get that win and having to work for it as well, rather than just driving off over the horizon, you know, when you have to fight for it, it's all the more rewarding, isn't it? It really is, and those are the moments that you really love in these sort of league races when you have to really fight for it and work for it and you get the reward at the end. It's a wonderful race by Russell Jacques to get that Evo class victory, and hopefully it's the start of many more to come. 
Well, absolutely. And speaking of many more to come, it seems like that's going to be the theme with Gianni Terha, who joins us in the box now. Gianni, Hello, another no. class win tonight, mate. You must again be over the moon. You had to work a little bit harder for that one, though. Yeah, this was very exciting indeed. It it's, was a bit sketchy with the qualifying where it's basically nothing works. <laughs> so that was a bit of a shame. But uh, yeah, I think I was quite lucky with all my positions. And unfortunately, Tristan and Nathan already crashed in the first turn together. So yeah, we were basically fighting for P1 with Marcel. It was a very great battle. Um, yeah, luckily was able to overtake him at a point And then it was keeping the constant pace because yeah, the tires are dying on this track very quickly so <laughs> i have to but uh, yeah it was a great race and that's the thing with these longer races isn't it there's more elements to them as opposed to the sprint races just being flat out so you've got to do a bit more maths in your head and a bit more self-preservation don't you yeah indeed it is uh what you say with the sprint race you can just attack and hope you get as soon as possible to the front and with this race it's if you are behind someone then it's like okay i'll just stay behind him save some fuel and uh at a point, he will make a mistake, and yeah, luckily that happened, and uh, I managed the race, I think, quite well at the end. Absolutely. Well, that's it. It's, you know, the score sheet can tell uh, tell many stories sometimes, and this is one of the nights where you want it to tell every little element of it, but still, great, great fun to watch again tonight, Gianni. Um, Montreal next time round, what do you reckon to go in there? Is it a circuit you enjoy? Uh, yeah, last season, this was one of the tracks I also joined. Um, yeah, it was a fun race that time as well, so I expect another fun race again. And uh, yeah, the competition gets closer each race, and that's also what I want because yeah, um, I don't want to be the most stop in the end because this was I before I started the league, I was not expecting to win so many races to be honest. Uh, so yeah, it's already with Marcel, I had a great battle with M Matty, I had a great battle in the beginning. So yeah, I look forward to uh, more of these type of races. So do we, mate. It's been great fun to watch, as always. Is there anyone you'd like to give a shout-out to before you go? Um, yeah, everyone. It was a great race again, and uh, everyone that I battled with was very clean. Uh, I basically got no penalties in all the battles that I had, so yeah, basically a shout-out to everyone that I raced with during the whole race. Well, it's been great to speak to you again, mate. Thank you very much for popping in to have a word, and best of luck next time out. Yes, thank you, and I look forward to seeing the commentary again. <laughs> thank you very much, Gianni. Much appreciated. Bye-bye, mate. Gianni Terha, such an enthusiastic bloke, isn't he, Ed? He's a real, real character in this series, and it's going mighty, mighty well for him. Certainly is. Both him and his teammate across Tristan Engelstad, very strong in that Premier class and also in the team's championship as well. They maybe lose a little bit of ground because RDSA spots, as they often do, getting first and second and third in the race overall. But still a wonderful, wonderful evening's worth of racing here tonight. It absolutely was, but unfortunately, that is all we have time for here tonight on Chaz Draycott Media. Thank you once again, everybody, for watching. Thank you to all the drivers and all the competitors and the admins and the sponsors for getting this all together. It's great fun as always, and thank you, of course, to you as well, Ed May, for joining me in the commentary box. I've been Chaz Draycott here on Chaz Draycott Media, funnily enough, for the Evolution Sim Racing GT3 Championship. We'll be back in a week's time, as you've heard, where we go to Circuit Gilles Villeneuve in Canada. It's bound to be a belter. Don't miss it, and we'll see you again very soon. Four French drivers at the French Grand Prix trying to win this on the final lap. The three wide again, Guillaume down the inside. Guillaume moves across, they're both in front of Milan and Pugge. Before you know it, we find ourselves here in the very final race of the competition. And then they see truck racing and they think, this is crazy, you know, these are five ton machines, 1200 horsepower brake. Oh, look at that switchback. Oh, <laughs> Racing isn't easy, but experiencing it is. 
iRacing puts you in the driver's seat with the industry's leading sim racing game. Drive on laser scan replicas of the greatest racing circuits from around the world. Go head to head against other drivers chosen by skill based matchmaking to ensure competitive racing at every level. Compete across all your favorite series. In officially licensed cars, engineered to deliver the most accurate driving experience possible. Join a race or host your own with players from across the globe. Race against the computer or in a league with friends. Feel the thrill behind the wheel. Visit iRacing.com.